What are we starting with this week? Uh, a we a review. Comment, a YouTube comment. YouTube comment yes, is correct. Actually, two YouTube comments. So they're, one of them is a reply to the other. Uh, this one is from our cult episode from late last year. It says, I would join Luke's cult, no questions asked. And the response is, not asking questions is probably key. Ah. <laughs> which ah. is true. Ah. Which is true. Yeah. I have a very philosophically consistent cult. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to join the Psy Guys cult, don't forget to check out our merch at normalcitizen.store. There might still be some kicking around. And if it's there's the not, requirements. We'll, be, we'll be making some more. Yeah. You, you gotta have all the you merch have to join to get the, cult. In the cult. Yeah. Also to get into heaven. Not not Psy Guys heaven, all of the heavens. The Christian one. We've made Jewish oh, heaven yeah. now. You gotta you gotta get Psy Guys merch to get in there too. You don't reincarnate yeah, the correct heaven, unless you got Psy Guys merch. In the Psy Guys cult. Absolutely. The Buddha didn't yeah. reach enlightenment. No, no, no. no. Reach Psy Guys didn't merch. didn't snack one of our cool beanies. <laughs> Let's start the show. Let's start the show. Oh, got a I wonder if there's a question. Oh, oh we got so bad at this. So my question for everyone is what's your favorite number? Let us know in the comments of the YouTube video what your favorite number is. If you're on Spotify or Apple or any other audio platform, head over to YouTube. Leave a comment. We've got a lot of other stuff going on just outside this podcast, don't we? Mm. Plenty of different yeah. shows. Loads of different things. Go there and check it out. Shall we start the show now? Let's start the show. Hello and welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Jamp, and Luke Cutforth is taking off his jacket. He is. Hello, dum, Luke dum, 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 jacket. down. down. This week we're talking about denial, and anger, and bargaining, and depression, and acceptance. Ah, the seven dwarves. <laughs> Is this grief? <laughs> the seven dwarves. <laughs> no, that's Snow White and the seven. There was five. There was five things there. Well, maybe there's two more. <laughs> Snow White and the five stages of grief. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, that yeah. is, that actually, that would work. She does go through the five stages of grief in that film. Fun fact. Yeah. Shall we, shall we maybe get into what the five stages of grief are? Sure. But what, actually, why don't, why don't, instead of me giving you a little overview of what the, you think, what I think the five stages of grief are, or what I know the five stages of grief are, because I've researched it, why don't you give me a quick overview of what you both think the five stages of grief are, Jam? Well, you just told us. There's dopey. No, no, no. <laughs> there's sleepy. No, 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 there's, Jam. There's the, daddy, and then that's uh, how Snow White has to grieve. I, I don't mean the five, the five stages. I mean, just generally what. What they mean? Yeah. What like what the what the whole well, deal is? What's the what's the deal with the five stages? First, of grief? what does it mean? I have to remember that. Oh, it's just as a, as a concept. Yeah, it's a concept. Right. So the five stages of grief is an idea that everybody who goes through loss goes through these, I guess, five stages of grieving, um, which all entail different patterns of behavior or like feelings. I, I guess I don't know. That's pretty spot on yeah. as to what people think the five stages of grief are. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they would be wrong. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. So you're you're pretty spot on there. That's a little teaser for later on in the episode. Uh, let's first uh, hop right into grieving and bereavement. The most fun way to start an episode, don't you think? Mm. Yeah. Let's let's get some big smiles on for Feel grieving in 2022. Jesus, Luke. <laughs> Smiling through the pain. Oh God. Too pretty me. So, um, what is bereavement? Uh, oh, is it question. mourning? No, no, oh, okay. no. Mourning is when the sun no, comes up. No, no. Um, is it morning? <laughs> no, morning. You are. No, no. Morning and bereavement. Um, they're related okay. concepts, but they're not the same thing actually. So I'm going to tell you what bereavement is, and okay. I actually learned this just uh just whilst researching this episode, which I think is pretty interesting. Uh, so a bereavement means to be robbed or to be deprived of something valuable. We often use it obviously ah. to um uh specifically talk about death. Oh. You know, um, you've got a bereavement as in. You, you had someone go ahead and get the skeleton man steal them. They died. Yeah, death is a skeleton oh. man. Trying to make it lighthearted. Uh, so by bringing up death. Yeah, yeah you know, the skeletons aren't very nice. It was a really lighthearted show. You know, the Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. It was fun. What is that? You keep on bringing up shows I've never seen. Is that no, another Disney show? It's a Cartoon Network show, actually. Oh, God. Check yeah. your privilege, man. I had Cartoon Network for one month of my entire childhood. Well, you should have watched <laughs> The Grim Adventures of Billy and Ma Billy oh, Mandy then. I was too busy watching Dexter's Lab. That's a good one as you well. You failed to take full advantage. Yeah. Well, yeah. Don't blame me for your poor... Actually, Dexter's Lab is quite good, so it's not poor taste. Just narrow taste. <laughs> <laughs> Also, it doesn't take a month to watch Dexter's Lab, I'll tell you that. So, we, we know what bereavement is. It's the it's the sort of loss, essentially, right? Bereavement is the loss, um, and you can express bereavement um, through, like, acts of mourning. And acts of mourning are the sort of, like, 
there are the kind of there are the kind of ways that you say I have lost someone, I am feeling sad, and this is what I am doing. I am mourning, mm. right? You're basically like interesting. Yeah, is is the mourning is that sort of like um is the sort of almost the action right mm -hmm. of like what you do when you've had um uh when you've had a bereavement. Do you have and, any examples? Oh, I'll, I'll get to them in a second. Okay, and I, it it makes more sense if I explain to you what grieving is and. Grieving is, grieving is the sort of experience of bereavement. It's the psychological experience of bereavement. So the right. feelings that you get when you have lost something. So I, I honest to I honest to God thought that bereavement was the period of time in which you go through mourning. So you've got a period yeah. of mourning. Yeah, but bereavement is. I thought that was basically synonymous with bereavement. Mm, That's no. interesting. Yeah, no, I, and I didn't know I didn't know the distinction between these three words either. Yeah, uh, and so yeah, like as I said, bereavement is the sort of like is the loss. Um, grieving is the ex the emotional experience of bereavement, like kind of like how um, thunder is the sound of lightning. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then um, I, I guess mourning is the the act the act of grieving, right? The actions that you take when you're grieving. So mourning could be like um, you know you have a funeral. That's a part of that's like a that's part of mourning. Mm -hmm. um, there's also there was like the period of mourning for like Victorian ladies. I'm pretty sure, which was like you know they'd wear black and they'd be all depressed or whatever. I think Mary Shelley carried her husband's um, heart in a bloody like a jar. Oh, whatever she that was her thing. She was that. weird. Yeah. So you know that whole that that's that, that's kind of um, I guess that's kind of an overview of those three concepts. Yeah. You think you you got them? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example of grieving, for example. Right. So uh, grief. So grief. I experienced grief um, when the latest Star Wars film came out, um, and it was really really disappointing. It was awful. And. There was a really you great story. Into a period of mourning. I genuinely, yeah. I am not, I, I no, I, I need to be totally clear here. This is not a joke. I had a period of mourning when, I <laughs> when the last, yeah. when, when the rise of Skywalker came out. Yes. And the last Jedi set up such an amazing film. And I had the same it, thing. It just, yeah, exactly. It, it the was last bad. Jedi for me was the best Star Wars film of all time. Same. Um, and I had such high hopes for the last film, and it was just. It just had to be the had to be the worst one ever. And all the plot threads yeah. were dropped, and yeah. it, they yeah. basically wiped the wiped the slate clean, uh, like basically uh, swept uh, the Last Jedi completely away, like swept it under the rug. Even bits like actively like yeah dumping on the Last Jedi, yeah. undoing certain things symbolically, undoing certain actions, removing the Last Jedi. like yeah. certain characters that yeah. should have been in it, um, making Finn and Poe like aggressively heterosexual for no reason. Yeah, I genuinely went through a period of mourning. And I've experienced, I've experienced a loss in the family. And I would say that Star Wars was not on par, but, oh boy. Far surpassed. That stuck with me for a long, <laughs> that stuck with me for a long, long time. Yeah. Um, I'm glad I could finally get it out. I still so, haven't reached acceptance. I think I'm almost there. Almost there. I genuinely remember a part, a New Year's party where I spoke to um, two friends yeah. for about an hour about this. You gotta get out, yeah. man. So. Get it all out. What's Thanatology? The study of Thanatology. Thanos. Okay, no. Um, it's the study of uh, Thanatos, uh, which is... Different from Thanos. Kind of, which is... Thanatos is two Thanos. <laughs> We're talking about the five stages of grief. What, does, what does Thanos do? Kills people. Uh-huh. So, uh -huh. Thanatos... The study of death. Yeah. Ah. Bingo. Oh, so it comes from the Greek um, Thanatos, which I believe is... <laughs> I handed you the answer. <laughs> Teamwork. But we still got it. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it comes from the Greek Thanatos, um, which I believe is a Greek uh, god. Uh, I think Thanatos was one of the the like the father, like the grandfather of Zeus or something. Mm. I think he's the one that was like fully eating his kids. Oh, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Someone okay. will probably correct me in the comments um, if I'm wrong on that, because my knowledge of Greek mythology is. You get a free um actually pass right now mm. if you want to correct. Greek mythology nerds, get in chat. You have to open the, open the comments and write um comma actually comma and then correct Corey's uh, Greek mythology knowledge. Um actually um actually only has a comma after the actually no um actually you cannot um actually me if I'm opening you up for a correction. That is my oh that no, no, I that's what drives can. me up the wall. Yeah, well I'm one third of side guys as well. <laughs> I say you can. Um actually <laughs> they can. What do you think? I agree with nobody. Okay. Ah, which it means you agree with Odysseus? It means nobody. Yeah man. Right? I really hope so, or you're getting another correction. That's I'm right. actually in chat if he's wrong. I studied look, I studied Latin and ancient Greek with the same teacher, so all of it is kind of like 
into one. Yeah. Let's move on. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Thanatos is also the origin for Thanos' name. Um, which makes sense because he sense. his whole thing in the comics is he wanted to oh he wanted to get it on with Lady Death. She was a sexy skeleton lady, and he oh he wanted her real bad. Yeah, genuinely, Luke. Um, that is the motivation for Thanos in the comics. Wait till you get to Endgame and Infinity War and see how different they made it in the films. Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm quite glad they made it different. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have liked to see a, a, a couple films where a big Thanos purple guy a skeleton, <laughs> yeah, a big purple guy kills half the universe because he wants to have sex with a like a living pile of lady bones. Yeah. Like that just seems far more compelling. Mm. Don't you think? He did it for love. So uh, moving on from Thanatos. So the Thanatology, obviously the study of death. Um, I just thought that was an interesting thing to bring up there. Um, but you know the other name for the five stages of grief, right? Do you know the, like the, the, the more sort of, um, I guess the more sort of technical name for it? No? Being a wuss. No. Whoa. Oh, sorry. So it's not being a wuss champ. Um, I know you said it was being a wuss, but actually... Uh, it's named after Elizabeth Kubler Ross, not Elizabeth Wuss. Uh, Jamp. It's the it's the Kubler Ross method, not the Wuss method. And the Kubler Ross method. method. Like the, the no, method, method not exactly. Kubler, Sorry, I was focusing too much on Jamp uh, <laughs> saying that uh, people that go through the five stages of grief are wusses. <laughs> I said, that, no, I said method. That's true. I actually am pretty hung Watch up on that. Watch the episode too. back. I think I, I have to go that. through the five stages of grief on just the fact that he said that. Oh uh, yeah. I don't wait, but why is it, you can people can watch the episode. I didn't say it. He said that people who are going through grief are wusses. Kubler Ross model. Yeah. Okay. I'm not saying it again. I've made my correction for my wrong. For my wrong. model. So like a model of grieving. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, like a like you know, a theoretical model. Like, you, yeah, you, yeah. Like it's not like someone built a little model, little of, model of grief. Just <laughs> the five little models of grief. <laughs> boop, 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 boop. Yes, <laughs> acceptance no. a tick. So Elizabeth Kubler Ross. Um, now I'll just give you a quick overview of her life because it's actually quite interesting, and we could maybe do an episode on her at some point. Maybe I don't know. We'll just we'll just skim over. She was born in Switzerland in 1926, which is a long time ago. Um, she, is she dead? Nearly a century. Yes. Oh. She died, I think, in... I hope her family are, are, are over it. Her family are also probably. <laughs> 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 there are nicer ways to say that. <laughs> no, well, I think no, I, no. I do hope that they are... Well, I hope they're not still grieving. That would be sad. That'd be a bad no, thing for them. I don't know when she died. Then. She could have died like 10 minutes ago. That's true. I got a text. I was I was keeping in contact. No, oh uh, she died oh, 18 years ago. Um, oh, okay, almost uh, August 2004. That's more recent than I would have expected. Well, she was born only born in 1926. Oh, born. <laughs> you said born, and then in my head I was like, died. everything that you're about to talk about took place in 1926. She did it. So all head, she was little, born an adult in 1926. <laughs> she did it all as a little tiny baby. <laughs> 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 Before she even got married, it turned to Ross. Just it was just models with Play-Doh. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Kubler Ross. Um, well, she was born um, Elizabeth. Uh, I, I think she was born Elizabeth Kubler. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. She was born Elizabeth Kubler, and so uh, in Switzerland, as I said. Uh, gosh, this is all over the place. Uh, she worked uh, as a relief worker in Poland, um, uh, sort of after World War Two. Um, and, uh, that kind of, uh, like she went to a concentration camp, um, in Maidenek and, uh, she saw these butterflies carved, um, on the walls and that really like hit her. She was like, wow, this is going to be real bad. Oh gosh. She was, she thought, wow, all these children were being killed and they still carved butterflies. Isn't that wonderful? Oh yeah. You know, like all these kids going to, through this awful thing, and they still found the time to carve butterflies into the walls. I forgot wow. that I wrote this, by the way. So she said, I've got a quote here. She said, it was incomprehensible to me. Thousands of children going into um, a, the gas chamber, and this is the message they leave behind. A butterfly. That was really the beginning. Uh, and so she wanted to then, after seeing that, she wanted to look into life, death, uh, and that sort of whole area of study. Um, and she started studying medicine in 1951. So she started training to basically be a doctor. And then she went into sort of psychology. She also um, uh, met her husband while studying medicine. Um, uh, her husband was American. His name was Emmanuel Ross. Ooh, huh? Great name. That's the Ross from Cooper Cooper Ross. Ross. Oh. Yeah. So that was her surname then. She had a double barreled surname. She yeah. came up with this by herself, by the way. Um, so yeah, it was her a woman. surname. No husband required. She came up with the five stages of grief by herself. Um... <laughs> And yes, it was a woman that came up with the five stages of grief. I feel like that's something that isn't necessarily brought up often enough. We often, um, and especially at that period of time, it's often men that, that, um, that sort of do these things. And this was a woman. 
It's just a shame that it's not necessarily empirically supported. We'll get to that. Oh, no. We'll get to it. Uh, so, you know, she met her husband, uh, took uh, his name and kept her own as well, because she's a boss. Uh, and she started studying uh, sort of psychiatry. 1965, she had a teaching. She started teaching at the University of Chicago. Um, uh, well, the University of Chicago Medical School. Um, and she started teaching seminars on death and dying. Um, and she had extensive interviews with terminally ill people. Uh, so she was in there chatting to him. Uh, and it was in this sort of like, it, it was over this time where she was like chatting to terminally ill people like constantly that she started writing her uh, her book. Or the most famous book that she's written, actually. I think she's written over 20 books, or, or like 25 books. But this was her most famous one uh, that was published in 1969. It's called On Death and Dying. Um, and that was where she uh, brought up, for the first time, the five-stage model of grief. Um, and we'll go through what the five stages are um, in a little bit more depth in a second. Yeah, so she published more than uh, 20, 20 books uh, about death, grief, the afterlife. Um... And uh, then she left academia in 1977 um, because her, her workshops, her books and all of that, her talks that were making enough money that she could leave academia. Um, and she founded um, uh, Shanti Nilaya, Final Home of Peace in California. Um, and that was supposed to be the sort of uh, center for people that were terminally ill. Um, kind of like a hospice, I guess, really. A place for them to go uh, and die nicely. Um and she divorced from her husband. Uh, she had a couple of kids, I think. Um, two kids? I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, so she then um, ended up um, moving to a farm in 1990. And she wanted to create a hospice for kids with AIDS, like children with AIDS. And mm -hmm. I've, so, I've, I've, I've read one place, children with AIDS. I've read somewhere else, babies with AIDS. Um, but uh, that, that didn't go very well. Um, it was the 90s. And her house burned down in mysterious circumstances. Oh, God. no. Except uh, somewhere else it said that, 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 a, that a community member burned down the house. No way. Yeah. And also another article says that um, she uh, had opposition in the community, which prevented <clears throat> her um, from, uh, it says here, prevented her vision from being fully realized. Is this, the op is this opposition, you think, because of the sort of, uh, what's the word? Oh, AIDS is a gay plague. Yeah, the idea yeah. that it's like there's a lot of even though it's then not actually com like you communicable unless you share blood or other bodily fluids, people didn't necessarily know that yet, and they thought it was like this like, but they did kind of know that. I think by the nineties yeah, they knew it. I think Diana had done the the handshake and stuff. Yeah, but that was that was like we're st we still talk about a lady bloody shaking someone with like HIV's hands, which that, is that was good of her. Bloody, that's insane. Well, right. but it was a big. No, moment. no, it was, it was a big. Yeah. It was a big moment. Even but that's, it is, it's yeah, insane. Just a lady shaking someone's hand. No, but that's what I'm saying. It's it's so insane that yeah. like that that is that was such a seminal moment um, that we we still talk about it now. Mm. When looking back, there was no reason to believe necessarily that you could catch HIV no. just by shaking someone's hand. Do you know what I mean? Right. So maybe it wasn't a particularly bold move on her part in that way. In like in a health way, it, well, yeah, it, was, yeah. it wasn't health. It was more it's she symbolic. was saying, "You're a person, and I'm going to treat you as such. I'm not going to treat mm -hmm. you as dirty or contaminated or yeah. Um, inhuman." Yeah, that you know, I mean, that's the kind of point, I guess. But yeah. also, it's just bloody bad. We're gonna do this year, but I don't, I, I don't have it really planned. understand why. I mean, like if 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 by that point it was known that it wasn't. Contagious in that in that sense. Homophobia. Well, I know I understand it. Okay. Homophobia. <laughs> I, no, sorry, I do know that. Well, number one, I do know that. Yes, thank you, Corey. I am aware of that. But come here for the science facts. Yeah, but <laughs> if you're making a hospice for babies, it's not like those babies are babies. Like, no, well, but <laughs> oh, sorry, it was abandoned babies. Abandoned what, babies. Not babies with AIDS. It says, um, so I don't understand how a person could ever be against abandoned babies with a horrible disease having a nice place to die. No, thank you. Burn it down. What the hell's wrong with you? So these are abandoned babies with AIDS. <laughs> of all the causes to be fine <laughs> Sorry, with. But it, that reads like a family guy joke. Like oh yeah, sure. I, like it's I'm building a I'm building a hospice for abandoned babies with AIDS like yeah. not even HIV it's like AIDS saddest thing and then another sad thing and then another sad yeah, thing yeah and like in the nineties yeah that, like AIDS was the <sighs> like AIDS was the one I uh, hope whoever burned that building down is having a very bad day uh, they just think the babies were gay 
No, no but that's, that's that was my point. Is it is it's just the association of like oh HIV, oh gay, oh don't like it, I, oh burn it down. What's wrong with people? And, I, and also, it's not contagious, and we know it's not. Well, I mean, it is. It, it is. Can sorry, not contagious. Like if you live nearby, you'll be fine. Yeah, it's not. It's sort of like incidentally. Like yeah. it's, it's only contagious through these very specific actions. Yeah, like, you know, sharing yeah. needles and all that sort of stuff. And also nowadays, like this wasn't the case in the nineties, obviously. But nowadays, I, I feel the need to say that HIV um, is incredibly treatable if you are a homosexual um, a bloke. Speak to your doc. Get yourself on some prep. Yeah. Avoid avoid getting HIV. There you go. And we a will do a bisexual bloke as well. Also, oh wow! Yeah, look at me. Check, that implicates the check on pansexual. Yeah. Uh, or, and pansexual bloke. Look, if yeah. you're if you're a bloke, if you're doing any, if, okay, if you are a person who is engaging in sexual or um, otherwise uh, engaging in sexual activity or activity that is otherwise um, uh, putting you at an increased risk of H or contracting HIV, mm. then please speak to your doctor about prep. Is HIV still more prevalent in? the gay community than it is in the wider population. I think so, yeah. But, um, right. It's just because of the method. Mm. You have sex. Yeah, right. of course. Yeah. No, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. So uh, we will do it actually this year. I've got it planned. I've got it down to the date. I know exactly when we're doing it. Um, uh, okay. An episode on the, uh, on, the AIDS oh. pand- on the AIDS pandemic. I thought you were all going to, you're going to put us all on prep. I have been doing day. that. Like I've been <gasps> slipping it into, why do you think the I water. give you guys water? He preps us water every week. <laughs> Yeah, I honestly, it's it's tough to know exactly why, but uh, yeah. So it was in. It, so as I've said, in one article, it said that her house burnt down, um, and in another uh, article, yeah, in another article, it says in 1994, after an arsonist burnt her house down. Oh, um, Ooh, bold. Yeah. So she helped open um, more than 50 hospices around the world. She opened the world's first uh, prison hospice in 1985. Um, God, she'd won a bunch of awards. She was a uh, 2007 inductee into the National Women's Hall of Fame. Um, and as I've said, in 1994, uh, she retired um, because an arsonist burnt her house down and she had been uh, trying to start uh, a- an AIDS hospice for abandoned babies. And I guess someone, someone like, really does not like abandoned someone babies Someone was not on board AIDS. with that. No. no. Gosh, let those babies die. No. Let's just let them die in, in a really bad place because I... Guess I'm a person that hates abandoned babies with AIDS. Was there were there any Clip casualties? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Okay. Um, so she then actually kind of lost a lot of her reputation. Like her reputation started to like kind of drop because she started getting a little bit kooky. Um, she wanted to look into near death experiences, spirit mediums. Uh, she was involved with a psychic. A psychic. I'm saying that in quotes. A psychic um, named Jay Barham. Uh, but there was a scandal in in 1979. I'm reading this verbatim. There was a scandal in 1979 when it was revealed that he had non consensually, oh yes, with female participants during seances oh whilst no. pretending to be an afterlife entity. Wasn't great. This oh. is why you get when you go for hypnosis. There's a camera that records mm, it. And you yeah. get the footage of it because you are being put into a state mm. of high sort of suggestibility. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's awful. Yeah, absolutely awful. Um, and so, um, y- yeah, I mean, like, gosh, I mean, this is this this sort of AIDS thing gets brought up in multiple sort of articles. Um, and it's it's just, it's not, it's not good. Um, uh, after the sort of burning down of the farmhouse, um. She or burning down of the house. Um, she had a stroke the following day. It was the first of like a few strokes, and this is what's this is what's confusing to me. It said that she died at home, but it also said that she moved to a hospice in Arizona, ne- like to be near her son Ken. Um, and maybe it was a like her son's home in Arizona, but it, it, it's confusing. Like it, it's not clear where she. Maybe it means that she died not in a hospital. Like she died at home with her family. Yeah, but then there's another one that says that she died in a hospice. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's so it's conflicting. Did she live in the hospice? I well, mean, yeah, maybe. but then yeah, so then she died at home <laughs> in the hospice. You yeah. know, yeah, sure. I don't know. <laughs> My point is that she died. Um, she died. Um, I think it was in. Two, I said two thousand four. Mm. Um, yeah. So it says she died in her home in Scottsdale, Arizona, um, and she was survived by her two children and her two grandchildren. Thought she had two children, um, but also 
um, another place said that she died in August 2004 at an assisted living center in Scottsdale, Arizona. Conflicting information. Doesn't really matter where she died. It was in Scottsdale, she Arizona. She died all over the place, apparently. It was just in Scottsdale. Yeah. Just a number of different places in Scottsdale. So she actually called up uh, and spoke to Oprah um, not too long, like, sort of before she died. Um, and <laughs> it was the last interview that she did that was broadcast. Um, and uh, she described her feelings uh, about her death as just angry 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 um oh that's, yeah. is that one of the stages that's one of the, of the stages anger. Anger. It's one of the stages is that yeah. the first one no which one is it second i think so. Nile, anger bargaining anger i think is second yeah mm. um but uh it, we'll, we'll again we'll, we'll we'll cover that in a second uh so um, and this is a quote from her son, Ken, says, Unfortunately, the public didn't want her to go through her own stages. They thought the great doctor of death and dying should just be some angelic person who arrives at acceptance from the get-go. But we all have to deal with grief and loss in different ways. And so this is, we'll, we'll get to this in a second, sorry. I know I keep on saying that, but just we're almost finished with, with her life. Yeah. Um, so she spent the last nine years um, of her life living in Arizona, as we've said. Um, and she wrote four more books in those last nine years, one of which uh, was on grief and grieving. Um, and then she died, as I said, in August 2004. We don't know where, somewhere in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, and then in 2005, uh, Ken Ross, who, as I've said, is her son, um, started the Elizabeth Kugler Ross Foundation. Um, and they do stuff, it's not important. Talk about it if we do an episode on her, whatever. Hmm. Uh, so let's talk about the Kugler Ross model or the five stages of grief. Doesn't matter what you call it. Both, um, both are acceptable. Both it means the same thing. Uh, so, a quote from her is, Everything was huge and very depersonalized, very technical. Um, and that was what she said to the BBC in an interview in 1983, uh, talking about um, the hospitals that she worked in dealing with dying patients. She then went on to say, Patients who were terminally ill were literally left alone. Nobody talked to them. Um, and I think, I mean, uh, was, would this have been during the AIDS pandemic in the 80s? Well, I mean, that's definitely something that happened. Um, during the AIDS pandemic in the 80s, mm. it's, it, like especially, it was particularly compounded then um, because, one, no one wanted to touch them because they thought we were dirty. And you mm. actually saw this whole thing of like a lot of lesbians would come out and uh, spend time with uh, people dying of AIDS before they died. Oh, lovely. Yeah, which is really lovely. So she um, she started running, as I said, she ran that seminar um, and uh, she then started doing those interviews with um, people um, with terminally ill patients. Then she wrote the book on death and dying and that was where she first described the Kubler-Ross method or the five stages of grief. Um, and this was based on um, terminally ill patients who were who knew they were going to die, right? So people talk about the five stages of grief as being, oh, someone I know has died, mm. and then I go through the five stages of mm. grief. But actually, initially came about as um, looking at terminally ill people and how they dealt with the concept of their own impending death. Right. Yeah. Um, and so she she noticed that um, she basically made up this model wherein people tended to have these five reactions um, uh, of like you know of this. Like of their of, of death, like coming um coming up, and she then kind of realized that um this could apply to more kinds of loss because obviously it is kind of a similar thing. Like you are losing your life, you other people have lost, yeah, you have lost yeah. someone else. I think about I mean? this a lot, which is really weird. Which is we don't really <laughs> think about the fact that when if you on both sides of dying, you're never going to see the person again. So if you're like like married, or it's your parent, or it's your child, or whatever, the person dying has to mourn every person yeah. in their life yeah. because they're never going to see those people again. Obviously, they also assume they're not going to experience. Mm. But like, whilst, whilst they are experiencing, they have to sort of they like come to terms with the fact that I'm attached to these people and I'm going to not see them again. This is the last time. That's a really interesting way to look at it because yeah. I have always thought do you know in films where someone sacrifices their life for someone else? Yeah. Like, okay, so let's say Avengers Endgame. I know we've been about it a lot, but Avengers Endgame mm. where, spoilers, uh, Hawkeye and Black Widow are fighting each other to decide which one of them gets to die. Love that yeah. scene. It's I it's a fantastic scene. Also, selfish, right? Like I think honestly, being the like choosing to be the one that dies is the most selfish thing that you can do because you, you get, don't need to deal with it. You get to be the hero. You don't have to. Yeah. You don't have to deal with like. Okay. Yeah. Right. So okay. Right. Let's put it that way. I am Black Widow or Hawkeye. Right. Oh, I'm Hawkeye. Right. And my friend Black Widow has just gone ahead and beat the crap out of me and thrown herself off the Soul Stone cliff. Now, one, I've lost my friend, sucks, yeah. and two, I need to keep on living and deal with the loss of my friend. Selfish, Black Widow. Really bloody selfish. Let Clint die, and <laughs> he doesn't need to deal with any of the stuff that he's done. Yeah. Right? It is the, it, it is the selfless thing to well, do. Uh, another one of Cory's hot takes. <laughs> no. And then we might not have had a Black Widow film that felt four years too late. 
<clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We could have had a Hawkeye uh, series that felt um, four years too late. No, the Hawkeye series was actually great. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, it was good. Anyway, uh, so seriously though, like I, I think it's interesting that we don't, we don't think about it that way. Mm. That we don't think about like, oh well, with the death generally, I mean, on some level your experience ends, and we see that as being far scarier or far worse than a continued experience. That's why I think the death penalty. Uh, on top of being inhumane and like something we shouldn't ever do, I think it's a crappy punishment. It doesn't work. It's like it's a crappy punishment. It's like, yeah. oh, you, do you want? Would you? What would you rather do? Experience nothing or experience terrible stuff for a much longer period of time? Wow, well, boring stuff. Yeah, boredom. I mean, in, I mean, in, I think jail is pretty terrible. I, I I think it's pretty terrible, but I think that uh, the idea of going to jail is isolation from society, as opposed to the fact that it's crap in there. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I mean, I'm talking about the sort of subjective experience of, yeah. you know, if you're, let's say you've got the death penalty, right? Mm. You, it's awful, awful experience. Like, oh no, I'm going to die. That's scary. And then you're dead. That's yeah. It. Compared to like, let's say you've got a life sentence of like 40. I'm, I'm wasting away. Yeah, like 40, 60 yeah. years of just like, n like you're not going anywhere. There's yeah. n there, like, wow. just a that complete. Would suck. It would suck, right? And I feel like, like looking around this room, you're like, I'm in here. Mm. For longer than I've actually been alive yeah. so far. Right? I feel like that is so much worse than, than death. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I just think that it's really interesting that we don't think of... that Somehow culturally we've seen death as this ultimate bad thing when like... Yeah. Hey, it's, 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 there are worse mm, things. It's at worst, nothing. <laughs> right? <laughs> at best... Something, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, come on, let's let's be real here. I'm not saying that anyone should yearn for death. I'm just saying there are worse things. Dumbledore was maybe right. There are things that are worse than death. Yeah, being in prison. Yeah, yeah. That's that should have been Voldemort's real fear. Standing on Lego. <laughs> <Barefoot. laughs> Wow. Imagine if you just got all the worst things and you made Voldemort <laughs> experience them all. Wait, 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 wait. Jam, can I just point out that what you've just implied is that you would rather die than step foot on Lego. For hundreds of years, yeah. Oh no, you didn't you didn't say you didn't give a just time. One, no, just the one time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, did, you gave no like indication of like number of times no. or length of time. No, just the one time. You live in a very volatile world, I'll say that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just making sure. You know the meme of like the, the guy who doesn't know which button to press? Yeah. It's jab. One uh, of the buttons is Lego, one of the buttons is dot. <laughs> <Die. die. laughs> <laughs> so that's how the that's how the, the five stages of grief sort of uh, came about, just through um interviews, like many, many interviews with uh terminally ill patients. And it was initially applied to your own death, but then obviously it was expanded to talk about other uh, other um forms of loss, like um other forms of bereavement. Um such as the Star Wars movie. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was yes. real bad. I don't know why you're looking at me like, like I'm being sarcastic. I am being sarcastic, and you think that that's a ridiculous suggestion. Because you, you're. I swear to God, if you went through the same thing that I did, yeah. you would feel the same. I way. did. Our, our I went through well. it with the yeah. with the Fantastic Beasts series. Oh God, I, God! I, I mean, went that, through that because that was yeah, that hurt. Ima right, imagine the Fantastic Beasts series, right? But it, but you had like you had a really. The, the last one was really good and it led directly into that fantastic. Imagine the last Harry right. Potter film was incredible, oh, wow. fantastic, and it set up, set up, it set up everything oh, in wow. Fantastic Beasts. Yeah. And then they just swept it all away uh, and did something. That would hurt. It was so, hurt so painful. Oh. oh my God. I can still remember speaking to Connie before it and Connie was like, it's, I was like, how is it? How is it? And Connie was like, it's real bad. And I had my expectations. Rise of Skywalker. Yeah, Rise of Skywalker. I had my expectations so low for Rise of Skywalker, mm -hmm. and it was worse. So the Kubler Ross um, model, or the five stages of grief, we've gone over kind of how it was. Dis oh, no, I discovered how it was. She discovered it in a, in a, in a She unearthed it. <laughs> like Moses. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> what? They unearthed Moses? What? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, man. He wasn't born. They found him on the top of the, of the mountain. They actually found him in a river in a little basket. Okay. That is the story of Moses. That is the story of Moses. Yeah. Congratulations. I know, I know my Moses stories. I watched the King of Egypt, Prince of Egypt. I watched the thing. <laughs> anyway, so she came up with the five stages of grief. We've gone over how that came about. But let's go over what the five stages are. So first, you've got denial. Um, and in the denial phase, yeah, you deny no. the loss. Bear in mind. As in, like, literally, like, this person has died. No, they haven't. 
so let's let's expand it out from just death. So bear in mind that the the five stages of grief can apply to any kind of loss, like I mean, loss of a job, loss of a limb, loss of a loved one, mm. loss of mm. a you know a very very tasty cookie, perhaps. Oh God, yeah, right. It's the worst. I'll tell you what, this is interesting. Actually, I started noticing for a while if I have a bad dream where something bad happens, I like deny that it's happened, and then I wake up because I'm like, this hasn't happened. I must be dreaming, right? And I did that for a while to wake myself up from bad dreams. And then like a bad thing happened in real life. And my brain was like, this isn't happening. And I expected to wake up and then I didn't. Oh, that's <laughs> really depressing. That's really <laughs> depressing. I've had this thing where bad things happen. And then I sometimes I dream that um, a solution has happened. So let's say um, oh, I lost my AirPods. Tragic. And I dream that, oh, I found them it was just under my bed. And sometimes, you know, you do find, I, like I do find, like oh, I've lost this thing and I find it so often it's just a dream and so i wake up being twice. so confused you it's lose them awful. when you lose them and then you dream that you found them and then you wake up and that was a dream and you grieve again yeah <laughs> but also sometimes i don't immediately remember that the, like the dream is just sitting in the back of my mind because it's just in the back of my mind it's just oh yeah i found it and then i go to yeah. get it and i'm like oh i think that might be denial actually that's absolutely denied true. That you have you've lost them so yeah. the first stage is obviously denial as lucas uh is so handily told us uh I, I i went through the denial stage with the rise of skywalker <laughs> where i watched it the midnight premiere did not like it, but uh, I couldn't accept that it was it was actually that bad. So I went back the next day and uh, I came out of it going, yeah, no, it was actually really good, actually. You know what? I'm still actually I, going through that with the first Fantastic Beasts movie. I'm still like, I'm like, I'm fully intending to watch it again going, I must have, I must have seen it wrong, right? Oh, There'll be something yeah. really good in there. Fantastic Beasts had good stuff in it. Rise of Skywalker. There was, okay. there was like, and then, no, I, yeah. there was like nothing, not to try and compare. I mean, like. As in, I think that's the reason why with Fantastic Beasts, I kind of got over it really quick. Mm. Rise of Skywalker, there's just Second, almost yeah. nothing. Second time I went to see it by myself, just trying to convince myself that it was actually good. And then um, on the third watch, I was like, no, no, this is bad. It's bad. No. So denial is kind of like shock and you have a, a sort of difficulty really feeling like it's real, right? So do you know that kind of like, that kind of like, oh God, like this, this thing has happened. You kind of forget that it's happened or you like, it's, it's really difficult to like, get yourself to remember this thing has happened. This is my new life now. Like I am now no longer waiting for Rise of Skywalker to come out and for it to be this awesome film. I yeah. now have to live in a world where the culmination to the Star Wars sequels is this is that film. Mess. Yeah. And it's I hard do, to, I do it's get hard, that. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to come to terms with. And I've been I've actually written a I wrote a YouTube video about this like ages ago that I've still not made but I think I think I'm going to make um, yeah. I think actually it'll come out maybe a little bit before like go think, alongside this episode um I wrote it uh and then you've got anger um so actually sorry the quote that goes with denial this is so I found these quotes I think from the NHS I can't remember links in the description so I found this quote that says no not me it cannot be true right that's the sort mm. of vibe and then you've got anger um and then that's like when the reality of the thing sinks in um you can like you can just feel bitter. You can feel unfair. Yeah, like, why me? Like, it can feel like it's unfair. Yeah, yeah like yeah, exactly. That's literally the quote that I've got there. Is why it? me? Why me? Um, and that's exactly what I felt with. And I'm going to use the rise of Skywalker because it is so visceral for me, and also it's not too macabre mm -hmm. and depressing. Well, it's very depressing, but only for a certain few. With with rise of Skywalker, I was very much feeling like, well, why for, this like, series of all series for crying out loud, yeah. JJ? Like why? Why did you have to? Why did they have to bring JJ back? Why did they have to ruin it? Why did you have to do it to this series? Like, especially when like I hadn't been that invested in Star Wars before. When I went in to see uh, the Last Jedi, I wasn't super invested. Like, I I liked Star Wars, like I really enjoyed Star Wars. But mm -hmm. I, if it was a bad film, I wouldn't care. And then the Last Jedi got me so invested. I was like, I cannot wait to see where this goes because it was the best Star Wars film. It yep. subverted my expectations, and it was like such a Star Wars film. But it everything was twisted, turned on its head. Yeah. And then J.J. Abrams just came in and just was like, okay, bleh, bleh, bleh. what the fans like. Exactly. And then bargaining. And that's the point where um, you, it, it's sort of with death, it's like you sort of feel like you want to postpone it um, or like feel like you want to make a deal for more time or like you can change your lifestyle to try and be like, yeah, I can, I can try and if I do this, maybe it will change. Right. And for, for me with, um, with uh, the rise of Skywalker, I was like, well, Maybe they'll make another. Maybe it's. Maybe they'll make another one. Maybe they'll fix it. Like maybe if like there's a if there's a fan outcry or like petition or like like restore the Snyderverse type thing. Like yeah. which by the way, when this when the Zack Snyder film came out of like the the, the Zack Snyder Justice League film came out, 
that renewed hope a little bit for me. Like maybe they'll do the same with Rise of Skywalker. Disney yeah. won't budge on that. No. no, Disney won't budge on anything. That's why Disney don't have like. That's why there's not been a single director's cut. Um, that's been like super publicly, like super pu- publicly well known or available for any of the mm. the um MCU films. Disney do not do that. Yeah. They do. Mm-mm. So yeah, <laughs> great. Like that was that was my case of bargaining. Um, and that's like uh the sort of the, the sort of quote that they've got here is like trying to postpone death or change the thing with good behavior, right? Like you feel like right. you can have some effect on this inevitable thing that has happened or will happen. Wow. Mm. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of what where, where bargaining is. Then you've got um, depression, um, which, oh boy, that was a tough one. Um, we all know what depression is, um, and that's like, uh, in in case of sort of dying people, this is where um, people like can be hopeless, oh, feel business. isolated, um, and when um, this is like people sort of preparing themselves for death. And for me, this was me preparing myself for a world where, gosh darn it, you had to accept that the rise of Skywalker. Yeah. Was, Do you think we're belittling yeah. grief at all here? No, I genuinely felt I I've I've felt like I have gone through multiple like like uh I like I've like I've grieved for like actual bereavements of, you know, like people and pets and whatnot. But like I think like I've felt very similar feelings with the rise of Skywalker. Yeah. Like I'm I'm being fully honest. Like I think it's a good thing to bring this up because yeah. you can feel you can grieve many things it doesn't need to be like the world you thought you were going to be in yeah more generally whether that's with a person in it or with a certain film in it yeah it's the, the you're yeah. grieving the state of the world mm. uh whether it's you know uh a global pandemic or <laughs> the fact that this one star wars movie came out yeah it's all inside the state of the world yeah absolutely and like obviously i'm not saying that this you know the rise of skywalker was meant as much to me as any anything else but like i mean i felt grief i had expectations and they were like I, I felt it it was very odd yeah um so those are the sort of um and th- those are the four stages and we've got the fifth obviously acceptance and that's the final stage um it's kind of said to be the final stage um they acknowledge uh you're, you acknowledge the mortality or you kind of acknowledge the event that has happened or will happen and um you kind of are prepared for it or you start preparing for it or you start to move on from it sort of thing um and th- i mean that's exact we know what acceptance is right it's like you know you come to terms with it um and so those are the five stages now I've said them in that order, and people always say them in order, but you don't need to experience them in order. I mean, uh, Kubler Ross, like she specifically said that, um, you know, they weren't, um, they were like sort of uh, not meant to be in order. Like her son said about it, the five stages are meant to be a loose framework. They're not some sort of recipe or ladder for um, conquering grief. If people wanted to use different theories or different models, she didn't care. She just wanted to begin the conversation. Um, and this is the thing, like, people, I think, misunderstand it. Quite a lot. They think, ah, the five stages of grief. Every single person, whenever they grieve, goes through these five One, stages two, three, in this exact four, order. Five, and yeah. It's very clean cut. But ultimately, these are just observations you made about five general emotions that people have yeah. when they're going through this experience, like experiencing loss. Okay, so it's not actually the idea that her model doesn't isn't necessarily reflected in the clinical data or in empirical data. Mm-hmm. It's it's actually our understanding of her model that is not reflected. Like her model was more vague and more sort of like. These are some things that some people experience. You might not experience them in the right order, or you might not even experience all of them. Mm. Whereas it's at you, what your like your issue is actually with the kind of pop psychology version of it. Yes. Yeah. And also, um, well, this is what frustrates me as well. That um, there was also uh, a study done, I think, in two thousand and seven, uh, like a like the first sort of one that was very large, that was like a sort of longitudinal longitudinal study that looked at people over the course of like um their grieving process um and that study found that um that study basically uh, corroborated the uh sort of kubler ross model but it it's been heavily criticized <laughs> and i've looked at it and it just seems a little bit like it seems like they were they found what they were looking for do you know what i mean so so when you say it corroborated the kubler ross model do you mean it corroborated like the in pop order. psychology version pop psychology in order, in order yeah and, and and actually, what would be called officially the Kubler Ross model is not that. No, is that what you're not. saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. absolutely. And it, it is interesting to me that um, it, it's kind of it reminds me of the Myers Briggs uh, type indicator, the, mm. the person those personality right. tests, yeah. wherein um, and it, this is this is something that um, is like almost exactly the same here. So we were talking about the Myers Briggs test and how that is used as a sort of a uh, corporate thing. It's used in companies to see oh, who is good for management. And ultimately the Myers Briggs test doesn't tell you how good someone is at anything. It just tells you 
maybe kind of what they fall back on, what they kind of rely on, like what traits they rely on. With the five stages of grief, or the, you know, like the, the Kubler Ross model, it it doesn't give you an exact roadmap of here is exactly how you feel. Mm. It, it just tells you these are some these are some emotions that people experience um, when going through loss, yeah. and you can experience some of them or all of them in like really kind of any order or any intensity. Um, but these are generalized emotions that you would feel. But ultimately, I think it's really odd that like this is something that is so. I mean, I understand why people latch onto it, but for me, it seems odd to sort of venerate this so much because the work that she did was fantastic but ultimately you can apply a general set of emotions to sort of almost anything that all humans go through because mm -hmm. every single person every single person goes through a loss at some point in their life right you can generalize out almost any experience like that right and it, it, it i understand the value of it to some degree yeah but i don't understand how in sort of pop science um and pop culture it's become such a sort of ubiquitous and mm. rigid model, you know? Yeah. yeah. I yeah. guess I guess the, the the thing I find interesting about it is like um so you've got, for example, denial the first time. The first one's denial, mm -hmm. um, and then bargaining was it. So like I guess I, I would find it interesting to have this put into terms of um like rather than the subjective experience, put into terms of like almost psychiatry about i don't know if it would be psychiatry like i'm not a psychiatrist but like in terms of like uh or the or i guess put into terms of like how i would understand it for example i would think about it in terms of like um your your brain's internal representation of the world and it's sort of inertia like not wanting to shift to it mm -hmm. like it, it's inertia not wanting to yeah. is the wrong phrase but um the fact that when a large change to your to your world happens the internal model of the world that your brain has um, sort of at first it just tries not to shift or struggles yeah. to shift uh, and then it tries to change it um, it tries to go oh is there anything I can do that actually will shift the world the way the world is back to the state it was before um, and then I can't remember the other ones like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But like, no, I get you that, put in that, those sort of terms I'd find that really interesting I mean I think the way that it's kind of was used I think probably one of the best ways for it to be used is um it's, it's spoken about clinically in a lot of cases. Like, you know, you can literally just search Kubler-Ross method in and then name sort of like any um, anything that doctors might be looking at someone for. Like, it's been looked at um, in sort of cancer. It's been looked at in diabetes. Oh, wow. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, as in, you can apply it to that. And I think the best way it seems to be used is loosely to understand how to deal with people sort of clinically. You know, like as in um, how to like uh, some emotions people might go through when they experience like say the loss of a limb or um like you know uh is suddenly becoming disabled or yeah. um basically any major adjustment wherein the person feels that they have lost something mm. um it makes sense to like kind of like look at that and be like these are general things that people could be going through but one way that i hate that it's used um and again <laughs> i brought up the the myers-briggs test is because yeah. it's used in corporations um, to like, it's used for it's used in the BBC, IBM, um, to help uh, people uh, to help employees go through periods of change. Um, it's so it's the um, Kubler Ross change curve, and it is a very linear thing, and it shows where people. Um, or, like, it basically shows uh, someone's sort of emotional sort of state, um, or like um, like pro productivity, or like you know ability to work. Um, oh, really? On a curve based on like the Kubler Ross method. when they'll be back to work at full capacity. Yeah. Uh Oh, and I just it, it, to, to me predict acceptance the acceptance period. Yeah, yeah. it just to me it doesn't oh, seem to be all that predictive. <laughs> oh, God. But uh, this is something that has been that has been seen is that people um, seem to be more able to deal with loss and reach that sort of acceptance when they have a longer period of time to come to terms with that. And also, yeah. people acceptance seems to be one of the most common things that people experience. And I, I mean, other than like people experiencing sort of like trauma. Right, because like you know, through grief, right? There's traumatic grief. We went through um PTSD, right? Like that um you've got was it not like a like you know most like a lot of people will go through a like, sort of traumatic experience, but not everyone will get PTSD. Um, and it's kind yeah, of similar. Yeah, on how quickly like if you if you can get treatment quite quickly, then you'll be less likely to have PTSD. Yeah, PTSD. but also like, also just a predisposition. There are people uh, that are yeah. predisposed. Yeah. Okay. And this, I think, the same goes for sort of grief, wherein like mm. some people can, uh, some people will not like. Uh, will reach acceptance a lot quicker than others. <gasps> we talked about this on After Dark. We did talk about this on After Dark. Yeah, we talked about it in in. Uh, I won't spoil it too much, but uh, in we talked about it in in context of of um, 
aphantasia yeah. about oh, being yeah. uh, the inability to recall somebody visually yeah. meaning that you're less affected by or like you seem less affected than other people who have the memory yes. of the lost person constantly called into their mind yeah. mm. um and so then according to this one psychologist slash psychiatrist i'm not sure who i saw interviewed um people with aphantasia sometimes state that they feel uh that they get get mm. move past uh, grief faster than other people. Yeah, specifically the grief of a lost lost loved one. Yeah, mm. and that was the November episode of After Dark. After Dark being our, um, I can't even say new anymore. It's been going for a good few months. It's our show over on Patreon. It's yeah. an exclusive show uh, to our patrons, wherein we don't necessarily talk about science. The conversation after Sci Guys, it 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 doesn't end. We just keep on recording it. Talk about philosophy. Um, we sometimes touch on science, philosophy, politics, anything like that. Uh, it's it's a good time. Go to our it's Patreon, check it out. So, I mean, the Kubler Ross, the Kubler Ross model. I mean, I, I guess I hope I've kind of got this across that it, she kind of came up with it as not necessarily um, this like sort of empirical, um, like very strict guideline for how people sort of will experience loss, but more mm -hmm. through her conversations, she had these observations and she laid it out um, and. A quote here from uh, Charles Core, uh, who uh, I don't actually have who that is. Oh my goodness, <laughs> um, an academic, I think, someone studying in, in that sort of field. In that sort of field, so um, he says, in some ways, if she had never used the word stage um, and said that there are, were five of them, maybe we'd, we would have been better off. But people might not have paid as much attention to her. Um, and th that is that is it, right? Like th the fact that we kind of view the five stages of grief as these distinct five stages, like literally in a Simpsons episode: one fish, two fish, blue fish, blue fish. No, I didn't have to look it up. I, I, it's the episode, it's the second season, 11th episode, I think. That one I did know because I looked up because I just wanted to double check to make sure that I had the, <laughs> that I had the right You're um, a nerd, man. Well, I, could. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to make sure. But yeah, so one fish, two fish, blowfish, bluefish. Um, Homer uh, eats uh, the wrong part of a uh, blowfish. Yeah. And, uh, well, they think he's eating the wrong part of a blowfish and they think he's going to die. Um, and he f he goes through the five stages of grief all in one go. Although they swap, I think, uh, they swap one of them for fear. I think it might be depression for fear. And he runs through them all in that one go. And that's a joke there, right? But the joke there obviously depends on the fact that everybody knows the five stages of grief. And everybody thinks that mm -hmm. you go through the five stages of grief. And like... It that's really interesting that fear is not one. Because that would surely be in impending death and also in the death of somebody close to you who you relied on fear is quite a big thing i think it's too non-specific okay no i mean like as in that's that's what i mean like i think that fear is too non-specific in because there's like like denial and bargaining can both come out of fear mm. anger can come okay. out of fear fear leads to hate yeah, yeah. 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 Donnie Darko. yoda fear and love that. oh that's yoda yeah i was thinking i was thinking Donnie Darko. <laughs> no, the whole to... fear love Oh, I was talking Dynamic. Yoda, where it's like um, the fear leads to something, and something leads to hate, and hate, blah blah blah. So the dark side. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so that is kind of the overview of the five stages of grief, and that's kind of like my issue that I have with it. Not the um, not the issue with the model itself, but more mm. with the way that the model has been taken in pop culture to be this strict guideline for how everyone should feel. If you want to use the five stages of grief to give you a sort of like, to give you a sort of like guide to how you're like, like to understand your feelings when you're going through a loss, that's great. And that's fantastic. Um, use it if it helps you. But if you're going to use it prescript, okay, this is, this is what we say so often, right? If you're going to use it prescriptively, then that is a no bueno, right? It's, it's a descriptive model. But when you try to use it prescriptively by saying this is how you will feel yeah. this order this way, no bueno. It's a it's it's it just doesn't work that way. And I don't think it was ever intended to work that way. Um, I had some quotes from her book, but honestly, I don't think we really need them. I'm just going to quickly talk to you about some other um, because let you know that there are other um, models for the stages of grief. Ooh. Um, yeah, and. You know, there's the Bowlby and Park's four phase, uh, phases of grief. That's shock and disbelief, searching and yearning, disorganization and repair, and rebuilding and healing. Um, and yearning, obviously, is like uh, yearning for a time. Um, yeah. And that's an, that's another really sort of not popular, but like that's another really common experience, mm. like yearning for that time, which I guess you can kind of say is it's sort kind of denial. Of, it's kind of denial. It's kind of bargaining, but it mm. is. It's it's it, because it's not really either of them. It is its own kind of distinct thing there. Yeah. 
You've got um, uh, Warden's four basic tasks in adapting to loss. There's accepting the reality of loss, experiencing pain of grief, adjusting to environment, and redirecting redirecting emotional energy. Um, you know, like oh, yeah. And then okay. Silverman and Class, which is the continuing bonds idea. Uh, basically, uh, they don't see that the grief is ever culminating um, in closure or like um, ever being like entirely resolved. Um, basically the people the idea is that people just um and, and i'm going to read this verbatim it says they propose that rather than letting go the bereaved person negotiates and renegotiates the meaning of their loss over time death is permanent however grieving and mourning can maintain the presence of the de deceased in the web of the family um they are remembered and not forgotten they continue to have a role in the memories of the bereaved and then there's the strobe and shut uh dual process and that's essentially um this sort of back and forth between um loss orientation and restoration essentially the um uh, you sort of focus on um, plans or activities that will get you back to like sort of normal um, until uh, when when focusing on the loss is like too much, and then because both of those sort of both of those sort of things are really difficult things to do, they're both like very taxing. You switch between them, so you um, focus on doing all these things to get back to normal, and that becomes too stressful. And boom, you go back to focusing on the loss, and then that becomes too stressful. And boom, you go back to the other one, mm, and it's this right. um, sort of um, Going, yeah, it's this sort of like avoid, like um, sort of trying to avoid it, and then confronting it, and avoiding it, and confronting it, and avoiding that, confronting in, it in waves. Yeah, and I think they all work. I don't think like people are complex, right? And I think they all um are general enough to describe people's experiences. Mm -hmm. Uh, and like, I mean, this is this is where I think think this is kind of um difficult. You can apply sort of like you can apply that kind of thinking to any emotional experience, like I've said. Um, there's not really any empirical data on it, and it's like, and the the data that there is is really widely criticised, and it makes sense because it's really hard to study this because it's there is that kind of subjectivity to it, right? Um, and if you're looking for a particular model, you're probably going to find it because at some point people are going to be experiencing these emotions, right? Um, and I think the bit that really winds me up the most is the fact that it, culturally it is basically the same as Stockholm syndrome or the Myers Briggs, -Briggs uh, personality indicator or the type indicator wherein people have just taken this thing and run with it and it's basically broken the usage of it it makes it not as useful as it could or should be um and i think i'll end on what i think the most important thing that you should take away from the kubler ross model is is that you should listen to people that you're trying to help that's how she built that model by listening to people when nobody else was listening to them um and hear from them what they're experiencing and what they want and need and you'll probably come off a little bit better and that's it very good. Shall we well, not, move on to a very. quick fire quiz? <gasps> dun 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 dun. Grieving edition. edition. Well, very somber, very solemn. Mm. I will solemnly tell you the rules of the quick fire quiz. They are the same as always. I will read out the question. I will have to finish reading the question before you can buzz in with your answer. It is one question with the two of you. The first person to buzz in with the correct answer wins. And um, what did they win, Jamp? Nothing. You got damn right. So, <laughs> whoa, reset the energy. <laughs> Luke, what is your buzzer? Oh. Jamp, what is your buzzer? Bong. Oh, that's a church bell. A funeral bell. bell. Yeah. yeah. Very, Very good. good. What are the five stages of grief in the usual order? Bong. Go on, you can take this. Jamp. Stage one, denial. Yes. Stage two, anger. Yes. Stage Ooh. three, bargaining. Wow, yes. Wow. Stage four, depression. Yes. Whoa. Stage five, acceptance. Ding, 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 ding. Wow, you just wow. the hell out of that. Well if done. anyone is counting, that is, I'm going to give that five points. That is incredible. What? Okay. Whoa. Five that was just five, five things in order. That yeah, was yeah. very, that was One good. Stage. I think it's actually 25 points because it's five things in the correct order and the 25 possible orders. So well done. Thank you. So all, all the extra points are the ones no, but then that it should I didn't be, say because it should be correct. 30. Mm, no, I think 25 is enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let's not get ahead that's of us. Okay. Yeah, let's not get too silly. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I think that's it, unless you do want to add anything to the end of this one. Five more points. It's 30 now. Hey, hey, thank you. you. <laughs> Five points to Gryffindor. Well, before we go, we would like to thank all of our patrons yeah. and thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday and why not leave us a nice wee comment? You can support the pod on patreon.com forward slash side guys or you can join the community over on our discord or you can get some of our merch over at normalcitizen.store or you can find and contact us at side guys pod on twitter facebook and instagram or send us an email at side guys pod at gmail.com side guys pod gmail.com side guys pod at gmail.com you can follow me at not car everywhere you can follow me at jamkin everywhere you can follow me at luke cutforth everywhere and goodbye i'm sorry for your loss the loss at the end of this episode. You have to grieve till next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.